right, everybody, welcome back to the second volume of the Disturbing Rabbit Holes Collection. We've got some insane entries to cover today, ranging from unsolved disappearances to space program accidents, all the way to terrifying and obscure mental health conditions. So grab something to eat, get comfortable, and shut the blinds, because this is volume two of the Disturbing Rabbit Holes Collection. On September the 12th, 1962, President John F. Kennedy gave his famous address at Rice University. It was an attempt to reignite the nation's support for space exploration, in particular, for a manned mission to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. As you already know, America and the world would soon become obsessed with spaceflight, stemming from both a childlike curiosity to explore, as well as a power struggle between the world's two most powerful nations. The space race resulted in many impressive achievements for humanity, ultimately reaching a climax when the United States executed their Apollo 11 mission, landing a man on the moon. It's an amazing tale of ingenuity and national pride on both sides, but little do we discuss the horrific mistakes that were made along the way. Before Apollo 11 reached the moon, there were several other manned missions as part of the program that paved the way for their success. The first of which, bearing the greatest sacrifice of them all, was Apollo 1. Apollo 1, at the time referred to as AS-204, was intended to be the very first manned mission within the program. This initial stage of the project simply had the goal of testing the Apollo Command and Service Module in space. By launching it into a 14-day orbit around the Earth before returning to the surface. The three crew members selected for the project were Virgil Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chaffee. The first two had already been to space in previous NASA missions. However, this mission would be Chaffee's very first spaceflight. On August the 19th, 1966, a spacecraft review meeting was held. Among those in attendance were the three crew members, as well as Joseph Shea, who was the Apollo spacecraft program office manager, responsible for overseeing the design and development of the command and service module. During the meeting, the crew put forward their concerns regarding some of the flammable materials used inside the module, most notably nylon netting and Velcro. In response to this, Joseph Shea ordered his staff to have the manufacturer remove the flammable material from the cabin, but didn't check to ensure that the order was followed after the fact. Following the meeting, Shea gave the spacecraft a passing grade and pushed the design forward. In response to this, the three men snapped a photo with their heads bowed in prayer over the module, and the following inscription attached below in a joking manner. It isn't that we don't trust you, Joe, but this time we've decided to go over your head. Fast forward several months to the 27th of January, 1967, one month before the mission was set to take place, when the three crew members were conducting a launch simulation at Cape Kennedy Air Force Station. While the three crew members were locked inside of the module, sitting in their pressure suits hooked up to both the oxygen and communication systems, a fire broke out inside of the cabin. It engulfed the entirety of the tiny space in moments, as the module was pressurized with pure oxygen. The following is an audio recording from the incident. Thank you. 
All three men died in a matter of seconds. The intense fire caused the cabin pressure to immediately rise up to 29 PSI, rupturing through the side of the module and filling the air in the surrounding room with smoke and flames. The test was initially assumed to be non-hazardous as no fuel was being used and all pyrotechnic systems were disabled. Because of this, very few safety measures were prepared for the procedure. Furthermore, the masks used by the rescue crew were designed to be used in toxic fumes, not smoke. This delayed their efforts even further, not that they likely survived for very long. By the time the workers made their way through all three layers of the hatch, five minutes had passed. Although the flames had significantly reduced as the regular air filled the cabin, so much dense smoke remained inside that it was still impossible to see the three crew members. Once it cleared, a horrific sight was uncovered. The men's suits had been charred and melted to the interior of the cabin. It took nearly an hour and a half to remove the bodies from where they had been found. When the fire broke out, all three men were seated in their assigned positions within the module. But after the fire, both Grissom and White were found out of their seats, attempting to escape. However, they would have immediately discovered that it was impossible to open the hatch against the internal pressure of the module. After an investigation was held, it was determined that the fire was caused by arcing from faulty electrical wires. From there, the arc likely ignited one of the many flammable materials distributed throughout the cabin, which as we already know, the crew had expressed their concerns about months prior. After that, the pressurized pure oxygen atmosphere inside ignited in an almost explosive manner, causing all three men to burn alive almost immediately. On the morning of June 10th, 1991, 11-year-old J.C. Dugard left her home in Myers, California to catch the school bus. Her bus stop sat at the top of a hill. She'd only make it around halfway up before a gray car would pull up alongside her. The driver of the vehicle rolled down the window before pulling out a stun gun and tasing Dugard until she was unconscious. A woman then jumped out of the car and dragged JC inside before slamming the door shut and driving away. Several people witnessed the abduction, including JC's stepfather, Carl Probin, who chased down the car on his bicycle, but unfortunately, he was unable to keep pace with the vehicle. The story quickly began spreading through the local community before appearing on nationwide headlines, but regretfully, no leads would be found. It would be 18 years before the truth came to light. Once inside of the van, the woman removed JC's clothes, seemingly to prevent her from running away, and covered her with a blanket. Still afflicted by the tasing, she drifted in and out of consciousness over the course of the car ride. The two abductors, Philip and Nancy Garrido, proceeded to drive for three hours, all the way to their home in Antioch, California, 120 miles away. Once they arrived, they pulled JC out of the car, covered her head with a blanket, and took her into their backyard which was essentially hell on earth. It quickly became apparent that the couple had been planning the abduction for some time, as the backyard contained several weathered tents and sheds, including one that had been soundproofed. There, she was kept handcuffed for around a week. The doors were bolted shut by Philip, who occasionally would come to talk to her and give her fast food. After that first week, Philip began sexually assaulting her, explaining that he had been coerced into abducting her by the, quote, demon angels. 
and that she was there to help him manage his sexual problems. Garrido would also take large doses of methamphetamine for days on end, periods of time which he would refer to as his runs. While these were occurring, Garrido would force JC to perform favors for him as well as to keep him company. The man clearly was completely insane. He explained to JC that he could hear voices in the walls and was so convinced of this fact that he had her listening for them as well. JC eventually admitted that Garrido would cry and apologize profusely in front of her for what he was doing. After around seven months of her being held captive in the Garrido's backyard, she would again meet Nancy, who brought several gifts for her, including chocolate milk and a stuffed animal. She then proceeded to apologize to JC, and from this point on, both of the Garridos would play alternating roles between parental figures and captors. As a result of her abuse, JC would have two daughters, the first in 1994 and the second in 1997. Over six years into captivity, she now found herself a mother of two at the age of 17. Once they were old enough, she began to raise her two children and teach them to the best of her ability, despite only having a fifth grade education. To put it lightly, it was difficult for her to protect them from Garrido, who continued to speak nonsense stemming from his various mental issues. As time progressed, in what might sound like an odd situation, the three girls were eventually allowed to come into contact with the public. However, this doesn't sound so strange when you realize that by the year 2002, JC had turned 22 years old, meaning she had been in captivity longer than she had been free. It's a horrific thing to imagine, especially when you consider that some of the most important and pivotal years in terms of a person's development were, for her, spent in this terrifying environment. Philip Garrido had actually been running a printing business and JC actually worked there as a graphic artist. What I find to be one of the most interesting facts about this case is that while working at the business, she actually had access to email accounts and phone numbers as well as other interactions with the public, yet she didn't do anything to try and escape. Furthermore, it was realized much later into the future that JC actually answered the door at the Garrido home multiple times, but apparently, again, never said that anything was wrong or tried running away. Now, I've actually read JC's autobiography, and out of everything that she went through, this fact alone is personally one of the most disturbing to me. She had been manipulated to such a high degree and had been captive for so long that I don't even think that she saw running away as an option. There were also an astonishing number of times that she could have been rescued or tracked down, all of which the authorities failed to fully pursue. It's important to preface these failures with the fact that this entire time, Philip Garrido was already a registered sex offender and had been on parole for the kidnapping and rape of another woman back in 1976. Luckily, she was rescued by police that same night and Garrido served 11 years in prison as a result. The first of these failures occurred on the 22nd of April, 1992, when a man called the police from a gas station situated just two miles from where JC was being held captive. He reported that he had actually seen JC herself inside of the gas station, staring intently at one of her own missing persons posters. Before the call ended, he stated that she had left in a yellow van. The caller was never identified and the police never pursued the report. After the police finally realized what was going on and began investigating the Garridos in 2009, a yellow Dodge van was found on the property. Another missed opportunity occurred in 2006 when a neighbor called 911 to report the strange behavior seen in the backyard, including the fact that they had witnessed children living there as well as statements that Garrido was a sex addict and mentally unwell. 
A police officer would end up coming to the home shortly afterwards and speaking with the man in the front yard for around a half an hour, before simply informing him that there would be a code violation if people were living outside and promptly leaving the area. 18 years after her kidnapping, on the 24th of August 2009, Garrido took JC and her two daughters to the University of California Berkeley's campus police office. Attempting to host an event as a part of his so-called God's Desire program. Garrido himself was reported as being erratic, and the two girls as sullen and submissive. After scheduling an appointment for the following day, he left his name behind. The school, concerned about the appearance of the girls and the nature of Garrido, contacted Officer Ali Jacobs, who, after running a background check, learned of Garrido's past as a sex offender. Officer Jacobs attended the meeting the following day, noting that the girls appeared extremely pale, as if they were rarely ever exposed to sunlight. Jacobs then called the parole office to discuss what she had found, and things quickly began to unravel from there. Garrido was ordered to report to the parole office the next day to discuss the interaction at the university. That day, on the 26th of August, Garrido, Nancy, JC, and the two girls all arrived at the office, with JC going by the name of Alyssa. The girls were quickly separated from Philip and Nancy so they could be properly identified. However, astonishingly, even then, JC still held up the lie. She continued to go by the name of Alyssa, even defending Garrido by acknowledging his past convictions as a sex offender and stating that he was a good person and treated her children well. The two girls even backed up the statements. When JC was cornered into proving her identity, she apparently became extremely defensive and even angry at all the probing questions. Shortly thereafter, the Concord police arrived and Garrido was forced into admitting the girl's true identity. Only then did JC reveal who she really was. Even then, she was so terrified to utter her actual name that she had to write it down on a piece of paper. JC Lee Dugard. A reunion was immediately arranged between JC and her family, and both of the Garridos were arrested, with Philip receiving a sentence of 431 years to life. Our next entry begins with the discussion of an unofficial psychological condition called the Truman Show Delusion, which occurs when a person believes that they're constantly being watched. Typically, the delusion is accompanied by the idea that the person's life is entirely staged and that everyone around them is in on the script. Everyone else is aware that the victim is being monitored and watched, except for the victim. If it wasn't already obvious, The Truman Show Delusion was named after the movie starring Jim Carrey, titled The Truman Show, where a man slowly realizes that his entire life is scripted and that his every move has been streamed nationwide on live television. What's kind of terrifying about this condition is that there's really no way for someone suffering from it to completely disprove of it. Even worse, in this day and age, there are aspects of The Truman Show that have seeped into our actual lives. Of course, you could just rip your house apart searching for cameras or whatever, but when you realize that you probably have a camera facing you at this exact moment from your phone or laptop, those suffering from the condition become a little easier to sympathize with. You've probably heard people discuss how at times, they've been talking about a product one moment, and the next, they're seeing an ad for the same product online. To some extent, whether it be from companies trying to sell you things, governments coming through internet traffic, or even just a CCTV camera picking you up as you walk by on the sidewalk, 
you really are constantly being watched, our every move analyzed. Your internet service provider is able to see every single website you visit, and they're legally allowed to sell all of this information to big tech companies, advertisers, and pretty much anybody else who is willing to pay them for that information. However, with ExpressVPN, your internet traffic gets sent through an encrypted server and your IP address is masked. I almost always have my VPN enabled just to be safe, but I especially have it on when I'm using public Wi-Fi networks, as you never know who's trying to look in and see what you're doing. Once you have the app open on your phone, computer, or tablet, you literally press one button and your information is encrypted and private. Find out how you can get three free months of ExpressVPN by going to expressvpn.com fortune or by clicking the link in the description. This particular rabbit hole concerning the Truman Show delusion goes very deep and starts to enter into philosophical territory once we connect it to solipsism. The idea that the only thing any of us can truly verify the existence of is our own mind. The easiest way to understand the idea of solipsism is to pretend that we live in a simulation, something like the Matrix. Although this is almost certainly not the case, how can you prove that some superintelligence hasn't found a way to put your brain in a vat and stimulate all five of your senses, making you believe you're in some sort of a fake world? Even more terrifying, how can you verify that every other person you interact with isn't just a part of the simulation, a sort of robot designed to perfectly replicate the actions and responses of a human without actually having any conscious experience of their own? Philosophers have debated this idea for a very long time, and terrifyingly, you can't. It's literally impossible to 100% prove that you live in the base reality, or whatever you want to call it. The only thing you can truly prove to exist is your own mind and your own conscious experience. This obviously isn't to say that I necessarily believe in any of these concepts, but I don't recommend that you think about it too hard. This next one is a very obscure case, so this particular entry hits a dead end fairly quickly, but regardless, it's still extremely disturbing. On November 1st, 2008, just after 6 o'clock p.m., two children ages 9 and 14 approached their parents while on a canoeing trip in Sydney, Australia, informing them that they had just seen a body floating in Oatley Bay. The police were promptly called, discovering the corpse to be wrapped in a rug, bound together with electrical wires and an extension cord. Once the body was removed for examination, it was immediately clear that something horrific had occurred. 34 nails filled the man's skull and neck, the result of a brutal attack with a nail gun. The body was eventually identified as 27-year-old Chen Lu, who had been reported missing by a friend around two weeks before the discovery of his body. Detectives believe that the man was murdered with the nail gun in another location before being driven to the river in his own blue Range Rover and being dumped into the water. No weapon was found at the scene, and due to the lack of any real leads, Police released the gruesome photo to generate publicity around the case, with the goal of obtaining new information from the public. The case apparently remains unsolved to this day, with no possible motives ever being uncovered in relation to the murder, or any suspects being identified. So, I've seen this image floating around on the internet on many different occasions, but somehow the truth behind it has eluded me the entire time. To begin, the man shown in this photo is the center of an urban legend, going by the name of the Green Man, or Charlie No-Face. 
The story originated in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and outlined the story of a man with a deformed face who would be seen during the night, walking along the side of the road, doing his best not to be seen. Some said he was struck by lightning or by a downed power line, others that he had been splashed with acid while working in a factory. It was said that the accident, whatever it was, had caused his skin to turn green, and all of his facial features to blend together, resulting in the complete loss of his face. Some who tell the story say that the man actually died during the accident, and that this person who's being seen walking alongside the road aimlessly is the man's spirit. Others say he survived but hid away during the day, only to come out at nighttime when nobody could see him. It really doesn't sound like anything most would give a second thought, just some local legend that kids would spread at sleepovers or whatever. However, the truth is that the green man wasn't a legend. He was a real person. His name was Raymond Robinson, and no, these images weren't photoshopped or staged. Raymond really was the victim of a horrific accident as a young boy, which completely mutilated his face. In the year 1919, when he was just eight years old, Raymond was playing with some friends at Murado Bridge, near the city of Beaver Falls. At the time, trolley cars passed across the bridge, and as a result, carried powerful electrical lines. While on the bridge, Ray was dared to climb up one of the pylons to look inside of a bird's nest to see if there were any eggs sitting inside. There were two separate electrical lines of 1,200 and 22,000 volts, respectively. They were responsible for the death of another boy just several months prior. Somehow, while attempting to climb the pole, he touched the electrical lines, severely disfiguring his face causing extensive burns and injuries that led to the loss of his eyes, nose, and one of his arms. After an extensive recovery period, the boy survived and began living as a recluse. His face was so disfigured that he was no longer able to walk around in public during the daytime, because when he did, he would throw crowds of people into a panic. As a result, he was forced to remain inside for most of the day, only opting to come out at night when people couldn't see him to go on walks down the highway. This was fairly dangerous of him to be doing, as, again, he was completely blinded by the accident. He felt his way around with a walking stick as he made his way down State Route 351. He was hit by cars multiple times. Obviously, this is where the urban legend and the sightings of the green man began spreading. People would drive past him on the highway, and without any real time to process what they were seeing, they were frightened by him. He became a legend in more ways than one, and despite this, would continue his nightly walks undeterred. Raymond Robinson would continue to live a quiet life until his passing in 1985. On September 20th, 1988, at approximately 9.30 a.m., 19-year-old Tara Lee Calico would ride her bike down New Mexico State Road 47, as she did every morning. Previously, Tara's mother would ride with her, but after an incident where she felt that she had been stalked by a motorist, she decided to stop going. As a result, she suggested that her daughter bring Mace with her on the off chance that she were to find herself in a dangerous situation. However, Tara refused. On that morning, before leaving, she told her mother, come and get me if I'm not back by noon, as she had plans to meet with her boyfriend at 12.30. After that, she walked out the door and flew down the road on her mother's pink huffy bicycle. And... Like a ray of sun swallowed by nightfall, she was gone. When she failed to return by 12 o'clock, her mother hopped in her car and drove down her bike route, expecting to find her daughter pushing a broken bike back home along the desert road. But she found neither. 
Tara wouldn't see her boyfriend that day, nor would she make it to her afternoon classes. A short time later, her mother gathered some of Tara's friends and rode back out to the highway to search for any sign of the girl. When they all came back empty-handed, Tara's mother called the local hospital and rescue unit before contacting the Valencia County Sheriff's Office to report Tara's disappearance. Within hours, Tara was officially listed as a missing person, noting that foul play was feared. Immediately, both local and state police, as well as military and volunteer search parties dispersed in search of the girl. But even after two weeks of scouring the area for Tara, neither her nor the bike were found, though the search wasn't entirely without discovery. Shortly after the disappearance, bike tracks were found along the highway, indicating that she had pulled off the road and into a shoulder. As well as this, the viewing window from her Sony Walkman, along with a Boston cassette tape, were found. The fact that the device seems to have been destroyed is disconcerting. Detectives interviewed seven witnesses, all of which reported seeing the girl riding her pink bicycle northbound that morning, which was the direction of her home. Out of those seven witnesses, five of them also remember seeing an old, light-colored pickup truck with a camper following directly behind Tara at various points along State Route 47. After collecting various descriptions of the car, it's believed to have been a Ford. Each of them reported that she had been wearing headphones, seemingly oblivious to the fact that she was being followed. It was believed by Tara's mother that she had dropped the pieces of her cassette player in order to mark her trail, though this is unconfirmed. Not that I want to speculate too much on this case, but the broken cassette player, to me, is honestly a very scary find. In cases like these, the best scenario you can hope for is that the person disappeared of their own volition, but that doesn't seem to be what happened here. She had very clear plans for that day. She was supposed to meet with her boyfriend at 12.30 to play a game of tennis, and she apparently had classes to attend afterwards. Following the initial investigation, and several months later, a very disturbing find was made on the other side of the United States. On the 15th of June, 1989, nine months after her disappearance the prior year, a woman would pull into the parking lot of a junior food store in Port St. Joe, Florida. Approximately 1,300 miles away from where Tara disappeared in New Mexico. The woman parked next to a white Toyota cargo van before entering the store to buy some groceries. When she returned back, the white van was gone, and sitting beside where it had sat, was a Polaroid turned over in the asphalt. For better or for worse, she picked it up. The photo showed a girl, and behind her, a very young boy, both seemingly bound with their arms tied behind their backs, laying in a pile of pillows and blankets. Their mouths were covered in black duct tape, and they seemed to be crammed in a tiny, poorly lit space potentially in the back of a windowless van. The woman instantly called the police, who obtained a description of the vehicle from her and immediately began trying to block it from escaping the area. Unfortunately, however, no such van was found. As you might have guessed, a connection was eventually made between Tara and the girl in the photo. Her hair and complexion both matched, as well as a mark on her right calf, which correlates to a scar Tara had received in a past car accident. Another interesting fact of note is the book which lay next to the young woman. It was a copy of My Sweet Adrian by the author V.C. Andrews, who, as revealed by those who knew Tara, was one of her favorite authors. Once the photo was shown to Tara's mother, she revealed that she was certain that the girl was her daughter. In an interview with the Associated Press, her mother stated the following on the matter. She used to keep herself fixed up and had a permanent in her hair. Before the perm and without the makeup, I got out the old pictures and it's her. 
We also know that the photograph was snapped within around a month of its discovery, as Polaroid revealed that the particular type of film was only released the month prior. It's entirely possible that the photo was taken from inside the van, potentially even with film purchased from inside the store. The identity of the boy in the background, however, is much more uncertain. Relatives of Michael Henley, a boy who went missing in 1988 as well, believed that the boy was their son, who had gone missing during a camping trip in the Zuni Mountains in New Mexico. Unfortunately, Michael's remains were found just a few miles away from the campsite in 1990, confirmed through dental records, leaving the boy in the photo's identity a complete mystery. An interesting development I feel compelled to mention occurred in 2008, when Sheriff Rivera of Valencia County, New Mexico, reported that he had received information over the course of several years that two men, teenagers at the time, followed behind Tara while she rode her bike down State Route 47. Rivera stated that the two teenagers who drove an older Ford pickup truck resembling the one seen by witnesses began grabbing at her and trying to talk to her, before accidentally striking her, knocking her down, and running her over. According to the local sheriff's story, the two teens became frightened when the girl threatened to call the police on them. From there, they picked her up, killed her, and somehow disposed of the evidence. Sheriff Rivera says that without any hard evidence to convict anyone in particular, the case couldn't be reopened. After considering the broken viewing window from the Sony Walkman and the cassette tape found at the scene, I personally find this theory to hold some weight as well, complicating the situation even further. It has now been 35 years since Tara left for her bike ride that September of 1988. Outside of the discovery of the Polaroid, there have been no sightings of the woman since. What's so terrifying about cases like these is the fact that in some extreme circumstances, like we saw earlier with JC, the person does actually turn up an ungodly amount of time later. June 4th, 1960. Four Finnish teenagers, Malia Bjorklund, Anja Maki, Seppo Boisman, and Niels Gustafsson had entered the area of Lake Bodum. The group intended to partake in a camping trip along the shore. The two girls, Malia and Anja, were aged 15, and their two respective boyfriends, Seppo and Niels, were 18. Though the area was in a fairly remote location, the group had camped there before and were familiar with the surrounding area. Upon reaching the campsite after a roughly 18-mile motorcycle ride, the boys leaned their bikes up against some trees before pitching their tent. The two boys would soon have to head away for service in the army, but for the time being, they intended to enjoy their summer freedom. That afternoon, the group would go swimming and fishing out on the lake and the two boys would drink a fair bit of alcohol. The group stayed awake very late into the night. At around two in the morning, Mela would write in her diary, explaining that Seppo and Niels were now drunk, and that Seppo had left the campsite to go fishing by himself. By sunrise, three of the four would be dead. Anja, Mela, and Seppo had all been brutally murdered, stabbed and bludgeoned to death, with Mela and Niels being found on top of the tent. The girl had suffered the most brutal attack, having been stabbed multiple times even after her death. Niels, however, laying beside her, was found with fractured facial bones, but he was still alive the only survivor of the group. It's not clear exactly who stumbled upon the gruesome scene first. At 6 o'clock a.m., several boys who had been birdwatching a fair distance away 
apparently had seen the tent collapse down on itself nearby the shore, along with a blonde man walking away from the scene. Another source states that a local man of the area named Esko Johansson took two boys down to the lake for a swimming trip. When they investigated the horrific scene after stumbling upon it by accident, he immediately left and contacted police. Niels was found in such a horrible condition, unconscious, concussed, and badly injured, that it took some time for the police to even realize that the boy was still alive. The police quickly determined that the incident had occurred over six hours prior to their arrival, sometime between 4 and 6 a.m. Interestingly, during the immediate investigation, it became clear that the attack had occurred from outside of the tent. The killer apparently had used some sort of blunt object like a rock, as well as a knife, and attacked the four through the fabric, though neither of these weapons were ever located by the authorities. Plenty of mistakes were made during the investigation, the biggest of which was how little care was taken to preserve the crime scene. The site wasn't blocked off, and as a result, the evidence was trampled over by bystanders as well as the other police officers. There were a few strange facts discovered at the scene, including the fact that although both bikes were found leaning against the trees, the keys to both of them were missing. Wallets, watches, Seppo's knife, and articles of clothing were also missing, though it became impossible to verify if they had been there before citizens and police began tampering with the area. The police interviewed Niels as soon as he was able to recount his story to the authorities. He explained that although he apparently had almost no memory of the camping trip at all, let alone of the attack, he did recall seeing a blonde man through a tear in the tent as the assault began. The prime suspect initially was Niels himself, though due to the injuries he had received and the condition he was found in that morning, he was not charged with the murders. Focus then shifted back to this purported blonde man that had been seen by Niels and the two boys who had been birdwatching near the scene. Another possible witness, a 14-year-old boy, was sitting nearby the campsite early in the morning. Apparently, he couldn't recall hearing anything to indicate a disturbance. However, he did in fact report seeing a blonde man as well, at around 6am, matching the testimonies of Niels and the two birdwatchers. Locals eventually set their crosshairs on a man by the name of Carl Valdemar Gilstrom, a kiosk keeper who apparently had a reputation for being hostile when faced with campers. He was known for cutting down tents and throwing rocks at people who approached too close to his house. Despite this, none of his DNA was found at the scene. Nine years following the murders, while very intoxicated, he allegedly confessed to a neighbor, declaring, You bloody idiot, don't you realize I'm the Bodum murderer? What am I going to do? On the 2nd of August that same year, Gilstrom drowned himself in Lake Bodum in what appears to have been a side attempt. However, despite the fact that Gilstrom literally had a reputation for slashing tents, another suspect also seems to have a lot of evidence against him. A man by the name of Hans, who happened to have a very unfortunate last name, lived only a few miles away from Lake Bodum, and had shown up to a hospital in nearby Helsinki on the 6th of June. He arrived with his fingernails black with dirt and his clothes covered in red stains. The staff have stated that he was extremely nervous and aggressive towards them. He was also apparently a suspect in five other cases, even confessing to one of them on his deathbed. It's at right about this point in the investigation that some extremely strange findings were made in regards to the suspect. 
I'll start by showing you a photo of Hans. Keep in mind that he's blonde. And this is a police sketch of the suspect drawn up from a description given by Niels while under hypnosis. Yeah. Now, this case has so many twists when it comes to who the actual killer may have been. Initially, it seemed somewhat likely that it was Niels because he was the only person who was alive on the scene and was actually there while everybody was being murdered. Then you hear reports of this guy who apparently is known for slashing open tents and yelling at campers, and you think, no wait, that is definitely the killer. And then you hear about Hans, a local man who has been accused of five similar crimes who showed up to the hospital the day after this one was committed, completely covered in blood, and you think, wait, maybe he's the killer. And now, after seeing him side by side with the police sketch, you're probably thinking, yeah, that's definitely the killer, right? Well, maybe not. This is a photo taken from one of the funerals of the victims. The man shown here has yet to be identified. After taking another look at that police sketch, whew, without anyone who could be definitively charged with the crime, the case sadly went cold for a very long time. Eventually, by late March of 2004, four and a half decades after the incident occurred, Niels, now in his 60s, was arrested. According to new analysis of the bloodstains, the Finnish National Bureau of Investigation put forth their belief that Niels had been drunk, and that after being excluded from the tent in the middle of the night, he attacked the other boy, Seppo, breaking his jaw during the brawl, which eventually led to him murdering all three of the other teenagers. However, by October 7th of 2005, he was acquitted, with the court finding their evidence to be inconclusive. To this day, the case remains unsolved, and at this point it seems unlikely that we'll ever know which of these men actually committed this crime, if any of them. I hope you all found the second volume of the Disturbing Rabbit Holes collection to be interesting. If you did, let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a third installment, as well as any other ideas for entries you may have. 